Thanks, Johnny. He was uh, hitting the theme, if you uh, know where we're going. Today we begin a new series, Walking Through the Gospel of Matthew, and I, I want to just spend this time introducing it so we can jump into the meat of it next week. And if you want to read ahead, let me tell you where to go. Go to chapter 3. Start with the story of John the Baptist. We'll come back to these two chapters uh, by the end of the year, uh, 1 and 2. This is how Matthew begins. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Jashon. Jashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. That's Bathsheba. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his, his, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Maybe you've considered reading through a genealogy like that as something like kissing your sister, like it's important, but I don't love it, honestly. Um, what was that? What was that? Um, I'm pretty sure I butchered some of those names. I wish some of them were standing here to say, that is not at all how I say my name. It's, it's said like this. That's the best I can do. Those names, some of them are familiar to us. If you've grown up reading the scriptures, you know some of those. Others are very unfamiliar. Like, we just don't know them or their, sto their stories. But all those names matter. Do you know that? They mattered to the ones who wore those names. Some of those names mattered to the people who loved them. They were important. It's the same with you. If I acted like your name didn't matter, you would disagree with me, and those who love you would disagree with me. Maybe they're unfamiliar to us, forgettable in some ways, but they should matter. Names are important, and these names are important in history because they brought us to this moment. More than that, they brought to us the Savior, the Messiah, who, who not only brought meaning to our moment in history, but salvation to our very souls. All the names matter, but none matters like the one at the end of the list. They all stand in line to bring the final one, the ones that matter, the one that matters most. It's Jesus. It's the Messiah. We'll come back to him later, and really we won't leave him through the entirety of this book. He's the reason for the list. He's the reason for the gospel. He's the reason for all of us to have hope today. It's why we meet. It's why we worship. It's why we exist, because he is and he came. Well, if you uh, know your New Testament, then it probably it follows right on the page of a blank page. This is the first page, the first book of the New Testament. But you may be surprised, it probably wasn't the first gospel written or the first book written that we have in our New Testament. Matthew's time with Jesus came years before Paul's time of preaching and teaching and writing, but most scholars would assume Paul wrote first when he penned his letter to Corinth before Matthew even thought about writing his gospel. This is the beginning in some ways, the very first book of the New Testament, but it's really a continuation of what has been written all before it. Uh, Wearsby describes Matthew's gospel as a bridge from the Old Covenant to the New. Genesis 5.1 says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. 
Matthew 1 says, this is the book or genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. So the Old Testament speaks of the history of Adam. Since Adam began in the sin that contaminated, and Matthew introduces us finally to the one who would wipe away Adam's sin and all of his who came after him. The word Matthew uses here can be translated genealogy or book or beginning or genesis. Uh, this is the record. This is the story of Jesus. It's, it's the book we know to tell us all about him. It's, it's what brought everything to him. It's his origins story. Who's the writer? Matthew. That's easy. But who's Matthew? An apostle. Followed Jesus very closely. One of the chosen twelve. He was a publican. Collected money for the government, for Rome. Tax collector. Probably hated by all Jews. We won't even be introduced to him until chapter 9 because the writer puts himself in the story in chronological order. So we'll talk about him later. But did you know this? We don't have any word Matthew ever said. I don't know, maybe he didn't talk much. Maybe he was quiet and kept to himself. Maybe he let Peter do all the talking because Peter did a lot of talking. Maybe he had lots to say, Matthew, but it never made it here. I kind of get the feeling, maybe you do too, that Matthew doesn't care whether you remember his words. He never said it. It doesn't matter. What matters is what Jesus said, what Jesus did. The Master's words matter. And did you know this? Matthew probably wasn't the first gospel to to write or to put these things down. In an oral culture, everybody was telling the stories of Jesus. Everybody who knew Jesus talked about Jesus. But those who started to write, it took them a while to write it down, and Mark might have been the first, and Mark might have been using some others. But here comes Matthew, and he writes it, and ends up at the very beginning of our New Testament. Matthew's gospel is very much like Mark's and Luke's. Maybe you've heard them described as the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they they do see it together. They, They report it in like fashion, unlike John, who's pretty different, as you might know. But each is written to a specific audience. Matthew is a Jew, distinctively Jewish letter to the Jews. An account for them to read first. He'll focus on Jesus being the fulfillment of the old prophecies, the royal king that he is, and the anticipation of him coming back one day. Coming back. Just so you know, when we read through Matthew, we'll try to stay out of the other Gospels. I'm not going to try to compare if I can. I want to focus on what Matthew says, as if he's the only one we have. Matthew will use Jesus' own words, an example, to to call all of us to what he has been called to. And he won't just tell the story of Jesus, he'll call people to live like Jesus. Hare writes, what has made Matthew so precious to generation after generation of Christians is its fusion of gospel and ethics, faith and morality. The dominant characteristic of the first gospel, he says, is its moral earnestness. The evangelist sets himself severely over against those who claim that accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior is all that's required of them. The concluding warning, he reminds us, of the Sermon on the Mount is thus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Back to the names. Names mattered to the Jewish people. Maybe you've traced your lineage. Most Americans don't. Some do. Every family probably has one. Maybe you're the one. But most people don't know who their great, 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 great grandparents are. The Jews would. Their names mattered. The Jews of old could trace their lineage back, all the way back. So as this Jewish writer begins to write mainly to the Jews, he begins here. Of course he begins here, because these names matter. Right, says For many cultures, ancient and modern, and certainly in the Jewish world of Matthew's day, this genealogy was the equivalent of a roll of drums, a fanfare of trumpets, a town crier crying for attention. Any first century Jew would find this family tree both impressive and compelling, two things you may not think. It's not original with me. Somebody said it's it's like Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. If you've watched that on TV, if you've been there, everything that comes down the road, everything that comes down the road, every band, every act, every balloon, every float, everything is leading to the last thing that comes down the road. It all points to that. 
People at the beginning and the middle and the end are still pointing to the end, and every child can tell you what is coming at the end, the most important thing. Santa Claus. Well, coming down Matthew's list of names all through Jewish history is the one he's pointing to. Everyone here on the list is pointing to the one at the end, Jesus the Messiah. Right, again says, Matthew arranges the genealogy into these three groups of 14 names. Perhaps we should say into six groups of seven names. The number seven was and is one of the most powerful symbol, symbolic numbers. And to be born at the beginning of the seventh seven in the sequence is clearly to be the climax of the whole list. The birth. The birth, Matthew says, of Jesus is what Israel has been waiting for 2,000 years for. If you do a little digging, if you notice, you'll find some names are not included in the list. Some are not included in the list. So Matthew's list is not meant to be exhaustive. There are gaps in time. Robertson reminds us the begetting. If you have an old King James, he begat him. It, it doesn't always mean immediate parentage, but merely direct descent. It doesn't matter if you include all the fathers as long as the fatherhood goes straight through to the one you're speaking of. But Matthew has a purpose, and remember this. It's to remember this. In an oral culture, it's not so much important that you read it, because not everybody could read and there weren't manuscripts for all. It's that you remember it. So he separates it. He categorizes so you can remember, and the Jews could have. Matthew follows the lineage that comes down through Joseph by going back through the seed of David and Abraham because God made a promise to those two men and God keeps his promises. It mattered. Barclay reminds us that Matthew's showing us the pedigree of Jesus but also saying some other things matter too. Maybe you notice this if you read through the list. First, the barrier between Jew and Gentile falls down. Why in the list of Jews would he include Rahab of Jericho and Ruth of Moab? They weren't Jewish. Why in the forebears of Jesus would they be included? Well, as Paul reminds us, there is in Christ neither Jew nor Gentile. Second, the barrier between male and female also crumbles. In Jewish times, for Jew Jewish genealogies, you followed the men the fathers, the patriarchs. Matthew, though, includes some women. Why? He's making his point. Similar to the first point that we just said. Men and women stand equally dear to God, equally important in their purposes. Third, the barrier between saint and sinners also falls down. You look pretty close and you see some really impressive names in the list. And you also see some terribly flawed, messed up sinners who are still being used by God to bring salvation to the world. Jesus' own words later in Matthew 9, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And here in this list you will find sinners. And here in this room today you will find sinners. If you see yourself today as a sinner, you are in good company, in a list in a church, in history, that even a list of sinners can produce the Savior of the world if that's how God determines it will be. Let me give you a little heads up. It's going to be a long study of Matthew. We're not going to fly through it, try to finish it quickly. We'll take our time, and it'll take some time. You might get tired of it. But I'm going to try to get us to walk carefully, almost like looking at footsteps in the snow. Find the footstep and step in it. Stay right close to Jesus, cherishing every minute with him, every word he speaks. Watch him closely and follow carefully. And let me tell you this, I'll struggle at times to understand what Matthew writes. Don't be surprised if I also wrestle like you do with what Jesus says. I will not be the expert in the room, I promise you that. I'll talk about some others who know more than me, who have wisdom and understanding who've wrestled a long time, because I am, like you, a disciple, a follower, a student of Jesus. So let's do it together. Come with me. Let's take a walk with Jesus and watch him and learn from him and step in his footsteps. We're not Matthew. We're not tax collectors. We're not, for the most part, Jews. But in some ways, we are very much like him. We are also followers. He walked up to Matthew at his table with the taxes and said, follow me. Two words, follow me. And he did. 
I suspect the reason you're here is because you too have followed Jesus. The calling is an invitation. The challenge is also a promise. The sacrificing offer is a reward itself. The difficult provides comfort. And it's all summed up in Jesus' own words in Matthew 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened or heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There are so many things Jesus says and does. Matthew is a big collection of that. And I, I guess we're going to descend down into the mines and pick up a pickaxe and start working, mining the wisdom of Christ. And it'll take time and it'll take work to pick and dig and collect. But please know this, the bigger job is not to sit back and go, I think I understand. It is to go out and do. We will think our way through it, reason and contemplate and, and decide, discern, and hopefully though, hopefully though, do it. Following Jesus is active, putting his words into action. So don't come in here each week and find a comfortable seat and say, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Bring with you some walking shoes and walk the truth as you leave here every single week. Do what he says, not what Tony says. Trivia question. Do you know the name of the first emperor of the United States of America? September 17th. 1859, a most unusual decree appeared in the San Francisco Bulletin newspaper. This is history.com. It stated, at the request and desire of a large majority of the citizens, I, Joshua Norton, Joshua Norton, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States. The edict was signed, Norton I, emperor of the United States. The Bulletin's editors had printed the imperial decree on a lark, but over the next 20 years, its author would grow into one of San Francisco's most recognizable tourist attractions. He was often clad in this naval coat, an ostrich feather plumed hat, and occasionally carrying a, a saber, a military saber. The delightfully eccentric Emperor Norton I would walk the streets, eat free of charge in the restaurants, issue his own currency, make official proclamations that range from comical to prophetic. He even determined at one point the Congress was not necessary anymore. You may agree with him. As his celebrity grew, Norton I became a cherished mascot for the city of San Francisco. Photos of him in imperial dress were popular souvenirs, and Emperor Norton dolls found their way into some shops across the city. The emperor remained cash poor in spite of the handouts. In spite of the handouts. So admiring subjects often gave aid under the guise of paying taxes into the imperial treasury. It was 1871 when a local printing firm even ran off a special currency emblazoned with the picture of Norton I and his imperial seal. Sadly, on January 8, 1880, Norton I, Emperor of the United States, dropped dead from a stroke. But at his funeral a few days later, some 10,000 loyal subjects showed up to pay their respects. Maybe you didn't know that. Who is... Jesus. If you ask people all over the world today, you might get a variety of answers to your question. Is he a joke? Is he a fool? Is he a fraud? Or is he the Christ, the Messiah, the King, the Savior, sent by God to change our lives and change our eternity? And is he coming back? Matthew, writing for the Jews, but also writing for us. So let's get started learning about the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, as we plunge into Matthew's gospel and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. But remember this, names matter, and no name matters more than Jesus the Messiah. Joshua or Yeshua or Jesus means the Lord saves, or God is my salvation. And in Jesus, the Lord offers salvation to all. He, the Messiah, the Lord's anointed, is the Christ. 
But it does not matter a hill of beans, even if that is true, unless He saves you too. So today, hear the good news that Matthew will go on and tell in his gospel. Jesus was sent from God with a miraculous birth, ended up here, grew up here on our earth in Palestine, growing up and teaching about the kingdom for all who wanted to hear. And one day he would, as he prophesied, die on a cross, be buried in a tomb, would rise again on the third day. And someday after he ascended, someday in the future, he will come and take us home to be with him forever. So believe it. Die to your sins. Be buried with him in baptism. Be saved by him today. And let's get to walking in the footsteps of Jesus. If you need to come, you can come. I'll be up here or find one of the elders or somebody else in here. If you want to pray with somebody, you want them to pray for you. But if you need something, let us know. 